Good morning, everyone. Welcome you to worship on uh, this beautiful sun, sunny Sunday. I pray that if you're getting ready this week to, to head off on the roads to do holiday trips and events with family, that you're always met with uh, clear roads, easy sailing, good traffic, good safe traffic flows, and be careful on the highways. Several announcements to share with you. One we spoke about last week are caps for kindness, and I see a lot of you have brought your caps in. Um, we have next Sunday also, well you have through all of August to bring your caps in, and we'll be taking them up to Lakeside with us to help the youth up there make at least one buddy bench out of your caps. So keep collecting them. It's amazing. It's the one time I'm not upset when trash from the apartments bottles roll over into our property. I can at least retrieve the cap and, and then recycle the bottle. But thank you for your help on that. I know it will be greatly appreciated and you'll be part of a buddy bench that will be up there to help people sit and relax and enjoy fellowship times. Our parable study on Wednesday is resuming this week, and they'll be looking at, at the parables of Jesus, starting off with the Good Samaritan. And all you need to do for preparation for that is read over the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're going to use Amy Jo Levine's study on the parables and be focusing on her videos, which are really very insightful and also um, at times very humorous and as she gets us to look at the parables especially from the Jewish perspective so that will form the basis for our study so just bring your your insights your questions your wonderings about the particular parable and we'll listen to Amy Jo Levine's understanding of the parable and then just share and talk among ourselves and as our habit has grown to be within that class. We'll go for lunch afterwards. We don't know where yet. We haven't drawn from the hat, so we'll draw from the hat when we gather and decide, well, where we'll be going to lunch. And finally, you see in the announcements that if you are a strong mind, strong back, and have a, a vehicle, be it a trailer or a pickup truck, John Pierce at his home has a ping pong table we'd like to transport here uh, to replace the old one we have downstairs. So if you're willing to help that, see me, see John, and we'll try to, try to see if getting members together for this project is easier than herding cats and get us all together um, and accomplish this project. Are there any other announcements we need to make this morning for the good of the gathered congregation? Then let us, with the sound of the prelude, let us worship God.
may all who are able rise for the call to worship this Sunday. Sing praises to our Lord. Who heals us and makes us whole. Sing praises to our Lord, faithful children of God. Whose joy rises and our lives each and every day. Sing praises to our Lord, faithful children of God. Give thanks to God's holy name. God's kingdom is near to us. Peace, peace resides in our hearts. join our voices in our morning prayer. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of our complacency and routines, Set us free from our self-imposed bonds and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading for this day comes from Paul's second letter to his church at Corinth. The eighth chapter, beginning at verse 7. Through verse 15. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, 
in utmost eagerness and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this manner I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance, as it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. These are the words of God this day for us. Thanks be to God. So we are woken this day to the gift of a new day. We have felt the heartbeat and experienced the breath of life. We have seen the world moving and bursting forth in life all around us. So we pause in these moments to reflect upon the gift of life, its joys that we have experienced and its concerns that weigh within our lives for others in situations that they encounter. In these moments that we have gathered together, are there expressions of joy, expressions of concern we wish to lift up and share? Tiana. For Samantha and her father, who is diagnosed with throat cancer. Samantha and Rayanne's dad. Samantha and Rayanne's dad, who is diagnosed with throat cancer. Irene. I have a friend that was diagnosed with cancer, and her name is Cindy. And another friend that was also mother-in-law, her six, I'm expecting. Okay. So for your friends who are suffering through illness and suffering through the loss of family, let us pray. Kathy. You cast an RV on I-70 on the way to church this morning. It's on its side and on fire. It's on its side and the owner is there. Yes. Let us pray for the owners of the RV and also for the safety of the workers who are dealing, no doubtedly, to assist in that situation. Yes. Uh, yes, let us remember the people and the most unbelievable of situations dealing with Miami. There just aren't appropriate words to express. Uh, but it is a tragedy beyond understanding and belief. We'd also want to remember Marcia this morning. She's not with us because she wasn't feeling well. So may Marcia's health be within our prayers. So let us then, as we've lifted up concerns in our voices and as we lift up concerns within our spirits, know that we lift them up to a God who is present here and now and strengthens not only us, people in the situations for whom our hearts are breaking. Let us pray.
we have gathered here this day, O oh Lord, each as individuals, but within this time and place, you weave us together in an amazing tapestry of love. That weaving occurs as we lift up our concerns and our joys, that you weave them together in an amazing tapestry of your presence and spirit. We are tied together as family. And so when family hurts through illness and loss, we lift up to you the brokenness we feel and ask you to heal what is torn and care for what is wounded. We are woven together individually in the unique tapestry of friendships and relationships that have nurtured our lives as much as those relationships have nurtured us. And so when there is hurting and pain, illness and death among our friendship tapestry, our hearts cry and we cry out to you, O Lord, to mend, to restore, to give comfort and strength to those who are hurting. And gracious God, we pause in these moments because all we can do is pause as we consider the tragedy in Miami, for there do not seem to be fitting and appropriate words to pray that the words escape us. So hear the cries of our hearts, the murmurings of our spirits that are too deep for words, too profound for thoughts, but yet are a reflection of our love and compassion and concern. Be with us in these coming days, O oh Lord, as we as a nation begin to turn ourselves toward a day of celebration, to return to a celebration of our liberties on the 4th, like we missed last year and look forward so to doing this year. Help make us as a nation more caring, more reflective of the vision of our founders purify our souls, purify our lives and nation, that we truly may be a reflection of light and love for all people. And most importantly, gracious God, fill us with joy. So often that escapes us. We get so busy with work and tasks and things to do but let joy overflow within us as we gaze upon the wonder and the miracle of life and the gifts you have placed within us. Let joy overflow, overflow within our families, our workplace, our day-to-day -day relationships, for joy is the healing balm for all of our wounds. For we have gathered in your name and we pray all these things in the name of our Lord, who taught his disciples when they asked how to pray. He told them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
and now with our hands, we give of the gifts that God has placed in them to God's kingdom, to God's work, in God's glory. Let us give them always in joy. Amen. My theme for this morning is how long does it take? And yesterday I got the picture that it doesn't take very long, at least from our perspective. And I got that in, in two different ways. First, we attended the birthday party of our oldest granddaughter, Addison, who turns eight on the 1st of July. And I thought the most amazing thing we were dealing with was she's eight, and how did that happen? But then I'm watching this party that was a, unlike any other birthday party of grandchildren we've attended. It wasn't just grandparents and family. It was her and her friends. A big bouncy house outside and all of that. But then to watch her sitting in her kind of queen chair when it came present time, looking over her court who had provided presents with her, gladly and appropriately opening gifts, reading the cards and not having them read to her, 
and then quipping jokes off the top of her head. And I'm going, how does this happen? You know, how does this come about? And then we follow that up with traveling to Marysville and seeing one of my cousins who is younger than me at his retirement party after working with the fire department and the emergency flight helicopter crew for over 42 years. And I wonder, how long does it take to get there? It just seems like moments Addison was little and we were holding it. And it only seems like moments that Mark was just this squirt I despise as a cousin. And I want to continue that theme, looking at it through what should be a familiar scripture uh, for us. It comes from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 21 through 43. It's two stories woven into one. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd is pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead only sleeping, and they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to him, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the little girl got up and began to walk about she was about 12 years of age. At this, they were all overcome with amazement. 
he strictly ordered them that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. These are the words of God for the children of God this day. Thanks be to God. I wonder, I wonder, how long does it take to learn to ask for what you really need. How long does it take? You would think that after 12 years, this hemorrhaging woman would have figured that all out. After 12 years of health care bills that took everything she had, you think this woman would have walked right up to Jesus and said, look, Lord, I've been hurting for 12 years, and I need you to heal me now. It's not like Jesus was her first attempt at relief. She had already been poked and prodded by more than one specialist. She had spent her very last dime on trying to find help. Obviously, she had advocated for herself many times before this encounter with Jesus. And yet, when the moment came, when the healer of the hour had arrived, she snuck up from behind him, hoping to steal the healing she desired. How long does it take? To learn to ask for what you really need. Maybe she woke up that morning and had planned to ask Jesus directly for what she needed. Maybe as she dressed that morning she thought to herself, today the great healer I've heard all about is coming to my town and I will ask him for the healing that I need for this affliction has left me in pain and penniless. Today I will ask him for the healing that I need. Maybe she had planned to ask Jesus until she crested the hill and saw him in the great throng that had surrounded him on his journey. Maybe she had planned to ask him for what she needed until she heard Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, say, Please come and heal my little daughter. Without you, Lord, she will die. Please come, Master, please come. And maybe she thought, like a lot of us would, My need isn't as great as the need of that little girl. Yes, I have lived 12 years with this affliction, but this little girl has lived far less years. Her need is more compelling than mine. Her need is more deserving than mine. Maybe that's the comparison the hemorrhaging woman made in her head as she blended into the crowd that day. Or maybe she had already decided before she arrived that morning that she wasn't faithful enough to ask for any healing from God. After all, since her affliction had set in, she hadn't served on many committees at the synagogue. She hadn't prayed enough, pledged enough, or volunteered enough for many years. She hadn't given time, really, in helping the poor. Her healing had left her in such pain, she hadn't even been good at studying the scriptures. So who was she to ask Jesus for attention and help? She hadn't done anything to deserve it. In one way or another, she must have decided that she didn't deserve to ask for the kind of he healing she needed so deeply. 
She didn't feel that she could openly ask for what she needed. She didn't feel she could approach Jesus with her own needs, her own desires, her own hopes, her own losses. She didn't think she was valuable enough, needy enough, or as deserving as all the people surrounding her. It's a comparison. We all make it at times, don't we? Sure, I have my problems, we'll say, but they're not as bad as so-and-so's problems. Yes, I'm going to have surgery. Yes, I've lost my job. Yes, I've experienced a heartbreak of a broken relationship. But I don't think my problems are big enough to ask to be put on the prayer list or to share with anyone. Why should I ask God for anything for myself when there are children dying in, in Syria, when people are suffering all over the world, and when even there's people in my own community who are constantly having to dodge bullets around their own neighborhood? My problem isn't big enough to make it to the top of God's priority list my needs really aren't urgent enough. My needs aren't substantial enough. My dream's not desperate enough to ask God for anything. I haven't served as I ought to, done what I should, been as faithful as I've been called to be. Others, others have been much more. If that's the comparison we have to make, then most of us will never make it high on God's list of priorities. There are plenty of people whose loss is greater than mine. I can always find someone whose need is greater than mine. I can always find someone whose heartache is deeper than mine. There was always someone in our villages who's higher up on the priority list than I will ever be. There is always someone whose needs are far more deserving than mine. There is always someone who is more faithful than I can ever hope to be. When you feel that your needs, dreams, or desires are not important enough or deserving enough, be made a priority, then you will either shelve them or you'll try another way to meet them. And that's precisely what I feel the hemorrhaging woman does. She finds another way. She tries to steal her healing from Jesus. She sneaks up from behind and touches his cloak to get what she needs without ever having to ask for it and maybe be denied. She tries to get what she needs by hiding her need. She tries to get her healing by stealing it from Jesus. But Jesus, Jesus isn't making the comparisons we make. The grace of God isn't a zero-sum game. Healing one does not mean forfeiting and not healing another. Giving time to one doesn't mean there's not time to give to another. For with God, there is enough time and enough healing to go around. The bleeding woman is as much of a daughter of God as the little girl or anyone in that crowd. And Jesus has enough time for both. He has enough healing power for both. He has enough love for both. And he will not choose between the two then or today. Now I Suppose this is all well and good for the two daughters in this story. Healing comes to them. Life comes to them. Grace comes to them. But where we live, 
Not everyone who asks for what they need gets the kind of healing they are looking for. Not everyone receives the healing they beg for. Not every person gets up off their deathbed and walks away. But please notice this. Nobody, nobody in this story gets healed the way they expect. Nobody in this story gets exactly what they ask for. The hemorrhaging woman struggles for 12 years before healing comes to her, yet even then she discovers the real healing Jesus has to offer her comes when he calls her daughter. He speaks directly to her as an important person. He acknowledges her as being a human being of worth. Go in peace, he tells her, and be healed of your disease. And the synagogue leader was praying for the healing that would keep his daughter alive, yet he doesn't even get to avoid the pain, sorrow, agony, and grief of death. Why bother the teacher anymore? His servants come and say, your daughter is dead. Grace does not come to him until after his daughter has already died. Only then does Jesus say to that small, intimate, but stunned group, little girl, get up. Nobody in this story gets healed the way they want and expect. And maybe, just maybe, that's the way most healings arrive, on a timeline that's longer than you want, healing that is different than the healing you thought you needed, healing that comes not how you want it or when you want it. Maybe that's the way most healings arrive. Shane Claymore is a pastor and peace activist probably the most eccentric pastor you could ever come across. On his radio program, Speaking Faith, he shared about a married couple he had visited some years ago. They told him when he first visited them they had been unable to have children. They were about 60 years old at the time of this visit. They spoke to him of a day when they had been strolling through their local neighborhood's park when they came across this young woman who they could easily say by her pushing a grocery cart filled with clothes, food, and other household staples that she was homeless. They could also tell by looking at her that she was pregnant. And as they talked, they found out they were right on both counts. She was homeless, six months pregnant. They stopped and they talked with her. They looked at one another, this elderly couple, and not in agreement. They had never had children of their own, though they had desperately wanted them. And they finally said to the young girl, Oh, you can't live out here on the streets. Stay with us. Come back to our house with us. And we'll just figure this out as we go. The three of them really seemed to hit it off. After a few weeks of sheltering her, the couple said, to the young girl, if you want to stay here while you 
have this child, we would love to help you and the baby. We've always wanted children in our home. And so she stayed. She stayed. She gave birth to her daughter and came home to their home. And the four of them continued to live together. The couple assisted the young woman in the raising of her daughter. Finally, one day, the couple asked the young mother, Honey, what dreams do you have for your life? And she told them, I've always had the dream of going to nursing school, but I can't afford it. And the couple responded, we'll help you financially. We'll help you get through nursing school. We'll watch your daughter while you're in class and while you study. If you want this dream, will help you get it. And so she did. This blended family then lived together for more than 16 years when Shane finally visited them for a second time after receiving a call. The woman who was both formerly homeless is now a nurse the head of her hospital's pediatric unit. The little girl she had over, well over a decade ago is now 16 years old and getting ready to enter her junior year in high school. The woman of that married couple now suffers from advanced multiple sclerosis. She is dying. But she's not living in a nursing home as most in her condition would be because she has a nurse living in her home who takes care of her needs. And a little girl who comes home from school every day and sits by her bedside and takes the hand of the woman she's come to call grandma and tells her grandma, about her day. And as Shane was leaving, the husband shook his hand and gave him a hug and said, we always wanted a family. And we now, we know, we have one. So I don't know, I don't know exactly how healing comes or why sometimes it takes years, 12 years, or why at times it doesn't seem to arrive at all. All I know is that healing for this God of ours is not a zero-sum game. God has plenty enough love, healing, and compassion to go around for all of us. God wants to be a healer, not just of bodies, but of whole persons and relationship. God wants to be a giver of grace. God wants to heal the wounds of people who hope for more for themselves and their families. And with a God like that, you don't have to sneak up from behind and try to steal what you need. You only need to ask. You don't have to earn your way to the top of the priority list to get what you really need. You don't have to shelve your needs. God has enough love, compassion, grace, and healing to go around. There's always more than enough to go around. You are known to God. Even when you think you don't deserve a healing, know that you are known to God. You are forever named and claimed by this God we have gathered to worship today as one of God's special daughters or sons. Still, I wonder, how long does it take to earn 
learn to ask for what we really need from this God. To no longer see our needs as in competition with others, but to see God's reckless, infinite love as the foundation for the healing that our world so desperately needs and desires. This God we've gathered to worship has more than enough grace, more than enough love, more than enough compassion, more than enough healing to go around. Go around. Amen. Go in the name of the Lord God, who has more than enough, more than enough love, compassion, and healing and strength for you in your need today and tomorrow forevermore. Amen. Amen.